that is so funny that I fixed the stereo issue by doing the unrecommend ooh, doing the unrecommended thing. Unre um, I break the rules sometimes, Joe. Gotta break the rules. Where's my phone? Here it is. Um, all right. Welcome to the Paint and Paper Podcast. I'm Kevin. <laughs> I figured since our last time I need to be more emotive and spontaneous. So if starting fires makes it happen. Well, yeah, I'm Joey. I'm Kev. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, so before we started this, we were kicking around some ideas on topics, and one topic that came up was, how do you know, how do you know or what makes a session successful? Well, I think there's the, uh, the obvious first answer is it depends on the group, which is going to be the answer to a lot of these questions, I feel. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. I mean, there's still, there's probably some, some nuance to dig into it there. Yeah. I mean, I can speak for our, for our group. I feel like you guys love combat. And so there's one thing that I, that one tool I always keep in my pocket to that end is a handful of encounters that I can just plug in at any point. So that if you guys walk into that area that I haven't drawn a map for yet, I can throw an encounter in front of you that's going to take the rest of the session. You guys would have a lot of fun fighting through the encounter uh, and be none the wiser that you just stepped off the map. Yeah, that is something I think about a lot. Um, when I'm creating, when I'm running or creating a combat, I always feel like if somebody doesn't drop dead, if someone isn't making death saves, uh, I failed <laughs> and like that scene that sounds so toxic because that really kind of sounds like it's in evoking the um, the notion of adversarial adversarial DMing but I really think that um, there's a the the best moments in D&D &D is when you are just kicking and screaming to survive to the void absolutely yeah I think a, I think any good session is hard fought uh, and like hard won, you know, like you have to, you have to feel like you've earned it Yeah, too easy. And it's just kind of a breeze. Everyone gets on their phones. Yeah. Yeah. You really want to feel, you really want to feel that everybody at the table is engaged and you want to reward that engagement. Um, so I feel like what sessions what sessions have I and have you run that you feel that or that we feel have been really successful for examples? Oh, there was one session where um, my players had just beaten this uh, this psychic spider boss and okay. that it was the that was the completion of this quest and the next in, the next couple encounters um, were all about how their boss fight, uh, attracted a Balrog, which mm -hmm. this is like a level five party. Mm -hmm. So the next, the next, there was a there was a um, skill check to get away from it because they were like on on top of these like three story dwarven buildings. And they were trying to run back around doing skill checks to to outrun the Balrog, and um, you know it was really like if this thing catches them, it is save or die. Mm -hmm. It is or you know dodge or die. I guess in that mm -hmm. kind of case. Um, and the, the tension was so high. Everybody was, was like looking for their next move because they didn't want to be the one to get got. But at the end, everyone was asking for the next session because it was just so, so stressful and exciting. Yeah. I'm sure I just thought of another session that I was a player in. Um, we were captured by this, uh, kind of kind of pseudo roman coliseum like pseudo roman culture they had this coliseum where they had captured all these random mythical beasts and were just throwing them at whatever helpless uh adventurers they couldn't just watch them get torn apart and so 
the group was separated where basically all of our magic casters um were on one side Ooh, and I love that. the other side was the rogue and fighters um and so what it ended up being was both parties were pitted against a hydra and the fighter party which i was in had no magic whatsoever to deal with this thing so we had no fire we had no ability to burn its heads so what we were th what we realized was basically if we dealt more than 24 damage in a single turn to this beast it would basically regenerate health so everybody basically had to uh just sit there and tank damage till we eventually whittled it away at 24 points of damage at a time i don't i can't remember what fifth edition hydras have for health but basically what it ended up happening was the party rogue was just running circles around this thing with its double barrel shotgun just <laughs> shooting just shooting this thing in the face behind it um while everybody else was just dying on the floor unconscious she rolled um a nat 20 and the thing did um exactly 24 damage oh my god it, at like one point more and it, we would have actually have just all died and then that what is what gave her enough to go on into the next to kill it on the next turn so it was just so so tight and then when that 20 hit everybody was so stressed that was <laughs> that was the only time i've ever seen people not be excited about a 20 and then with the roll how much damage was it doing it was it was doing it had to be doing something like 4d10 of um like off the shotgun the oh, uh the, the shotgun. shotgun had to be doing it was either something like 4d8 or 4 10 so it was like it needed the high roll and um man when that hit when we got the correct amount of damage everybody at the table just started jumping <laughs> up and down and just screaming just absolutely screaming and then in the next one when all the wizards they just blasted the thing apart like within like less than two turns yeah i'm about to ask how the how the casters fare the, it completely steamrolled it oh uh, completely steamrolled it. Oh, the hydra yeah completely steamrolled the hydra oh okay because they had fire damage oh uh, i don't think i've ever fought a hydra before I yeah the thing. yeah they're they're interesting um if you deal 25 hit points it regrows ahead gets an additional attack and so it pumps out more damage and it technically regenerates hit points or at least i i don't know how the vanilla one works i've never really run a hydra i've only fought one <laughs> um so that was one time that i felt i that there was like a really really tight encounter that i felt was successful um experiencing it as a player one that i ran was i i like to make good use a great use of timers and i'll just roll a d4 it's like okay in this many rounds something will happen so yeah. And so sometimes the timers I use will be out f up front, super aware, being like, yeah, there's going to be a, dr a dragon is going to glass this place in uh, 1d6 rounds. You better get the hell out of here and hope I don't roll below a two. Um, other times, I w the, the timers will be a little bit less direct. There was one time when um, the players were tasked with going down into these ancient ruins and I, i've described this to you they come down to the basin of this uh cave and on the back wall is this giant door and it has these uh gems set into the um into the wall with all these runes and around the rooms are these braziers with um, these focusing gla uh, glasses they kind of just look like big monocles or big um, kind of magnifying glasses set onto the braziers and they realize that there's burning pitch on there and obviously video game instinct decrees that light the fire shine the door bounce the beam around the room and um, 
So they had to light five braziers, turn the brazier so that the beam of light would shine directly into the um, directly into the crystals on this door to cause it to open. As soon as they, this was a level, this is either level two or level three party. As soon as they would do the, as soon as they lit a single brazier, I just started spawning um, like one d six skeletons per. Uh, it was it was supposed to be per round, but I was just kind of just doing it whenever I felt like it. Yeah, I feel like that's the best way. Yeah, it was. It, I was just kind of having fun, just throwing just hundreds of skeletons onto the room, and basically, um, so there were skeletons spawning constantly. And I love using the rule where undead can only be killed permanently if it's killed through radiant damage. Um, any other circumstance it just gets back up like the next turn yeah i think the zombies have a built-in mechanic but I, I like that one i like that one better yeah i i feel like it's just easy um i also use for any undead that doesn't have a personality like you know has an intelligence higher than 10 i just straight up give them the min the minion rule of just one hit point they go down and then they get back up like next turn or next round when it, whenever i feel that the pressure needs to be increased so you had you're saying you had like a pseudo timer of like you know um yeah like massing of skeletons yeah there will be there will be some point in time when the action economy the overwhelming action economy of the skeletons overwhelms the party to the point where they can't deal with it by either running around or um doing whatever so it in a lot of ways, it's the the skeleton spawning is a lot like that classic trope of water filling the room or like the the walls closing in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a I had a timer in that same Balrog uh, encounter where um, he actually steps on a on a large dwarven uh, like three story building, like I said, and it it like collapses under its weight because it's so old. And, and mm -hmm. when the party wakes up from the being knocked out from that same collapse, they see the Balrog like trying to escape so i put a t i put a, a spin down d20 on the table and said this is your timer in this many turns he escapes and they got into a a combat encounter where i said all right you guys start on this side the objective get to this side i remember you talking then about this then you're safe but this is the ball rock timer At the start of every round i rolled the d20 behind the screen d20 roll didn't mean anything it was just for the player's perception Mm -hmm. But when they started getting You're fudging closer, the rolls? I'm fudging the You're rolls. Fudging rolls. I'm fudging. Yeah, rolls. nothing is sacred. Fudge your rolls. Fudge everything. So when I when I when they started getting close to the end, and there were still like three rounds on the timer, I I would do my roll, be like, ooh, and I would tick the timer down two points instead of one, and they'd be like, oh no, we gotta go. Yeah, 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 yeah. I um, I remember you were also saying that in order to escape, there was just this massive slog of like deep dwarves it and was a, orcs it was a uh yeah it was a a battle between draugr dwarves and orcs mm. and it was just packed the whole the whole course play was packed mm -hmm. to the brim mm -hmm. cool that's crazy that was a fun encounter yeah i think another um another key to a good session is trying to give each of your players uh, a moment mm. and a lot of the time you can't plan it and a lot of the time you can't really get a lot of um you can't get all of them in a session but like have you ever planned out a cool moment for a player mm, yeah i feel like i have um i i definitely try to look at who i have in my party like i remember there was that one time um when you guys were pulling up to that desert city uh on that skiff i was creating scenarios that i knew certain archetypes of characters would have a better time doing um so i looked at the it was like a for context the the players were journeying into the desert to like the the final town on the frontier and they needed to take this three-month uh, voyage on sand skiff across the across the sands into uh, 
to get to this place. Like getting there is like an adventure in it of itself. And I think everybody started at like level six or something. And um, they are, you know, a couple mile. It's like less than less than a fourth of a day away. They, they're going to be there. The party's going to be there in a couple hours. And so they sent out um, a scout. A scout skiff was sent out or something. They come over the next ridge. They see this, this uh, damaged skiff. No, the crew is gone. And this was a combat encounter. But before the combat encounter started, I gave the players the opportunity to go and investigate the skiff. And so... I basically created this moment for the players who were more RP centric and more investigation centric to kind of have a moment of be like, oh, what's going on? Let's look around. Why is there blood on the sand? There's like these scratches all across the deck. And it seems like the, the, all of these scratches come up from under it so so maybe there's something in the sand that attacked this uh thing maybe there's something that's going to come up from the sands and so they they get to the thing they kick open the base hatch they find a dwarf that is huddled there was a dwarven character there and i was like oh dope and as soon as i knew that i made sure that the dwarf npc that was like huddled and wounded was basically just shouting gibberish in dwarvish so that the so that the dwarf character could have an rp moment of like calming down his king uh his clan brother or like kinsman and um so that way i gave like a whole bunch of different people stuff and then back at the other start so the party was like kind of separated it, it in a way it was kind of, it wasn't mechanically separated in like one round they could get back to each other However, narratively, they were separated. They couldn't communicate freely with each other. And they were, there was the stress of like, okay, we aren't at full strength. These player, I mean, that being said, it was like an eight player game. So like there were three people out, five people back on the ship. And it, there was like a lot of mounting stress for the people that were back on the ship trying to um, figure out what was going on, look around, perception checks. And so those people that were more, not maybe a little bit, I wasn't like specifically trying to break it up, but of course the people that are going to go out and investigate are going to be the more RP centric players. So that was a good, I feel a good successful moment where the RP players had their time and the combat players were just there, like, you know, sharpening their daggers, waiting for the stuff to pop off. And um, it was great because then the next moment everything just exploded giant crabs and gnolls exploding that out of caverns fight. and stuff yeah um, and a good time to be a barbarian yeah and then moving into like the next stage of that uh, there was a big fog cloud that came the crab the giant crab and um, uh, gnolls like came up you guys didn't really know what was going on there was one player who had a blind sight that was able to fend fend off there's another player that was more um able to keep people calm there was another player who was uh you you just dove right into it and you're this barbarian just blindly swinging into i didn't even know fog. what i was killing for a good long time yeah i just knew that i was killing yeah and i was i was just giving you descriptions of like uh, your, your your battle instinct just takes over as you are just rending um, flesh. You feel your axe hitting um, the uh, like what is known to you. You're doing like what you're doing, and it's like the 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 stereotype of like the barbarian that goes into the blind rage, who is literally blinded by fog, is like it was a very cool moment, just like narratively for that character, and also mechanically for um uh for you because you were just like just being an absolute powerhouse just killing like things left and do. right i do love barbarian yeah so yeah i think that that was like a good one a good instance where i feel it was like mechanically mechanically and narratively satisfying and successful so it sounds like these were instances where you had cool moments 
and I didn't even, I didn't even think of it in this way. It was a cool moment that anybody could step up to the plate for. Right? Yeah. It was any, any, if the fighter had stepped up and t- dove into the fog, like we could have dove in together, but mm-hmm. it's really anyone, anyone who wants to be a part of that cool moment. Yeah. I like to try, I guess, I guess, I guess that's right. I guess that is kind of more my philosophy. I try to just create a cool scenario and then whoever bites on the hook, I take them and elevate them on how that character would deal with that scenario. Mm hmm. Um, so what else what about you any other scenarios well uh, I have a I had a player in uh, that same campaign he was actually introduced he, he first joined for that Balrog session and then um, he was a halfling warlock of Abraxas who is a real world like eldritch patron of weird knowledge it's that I think I've I've shown you the picture before but it's a a chicken-headed, snake-legged god who uh, snake rides. Legs. Yeah, snake legs, and he and he rides a chariot. And to be clear, the snake heads have the ropes of the chariot, and that's it's a very weird. And that's why he picked it. But it was very fun because I started reading about this crazy, this crazy real world, like whatever you even call that. Uh-huh. Uh, and there was this thing about Abraxas stones that uh, in his mythology i was like oh i can do something with that i got a weird knowledge so i just uh so this is a this is a little bit planned a little bit unplanned Uh uh-huh the the abraxas stone um it was a kind of thing where it had a charge and as long as it had a charge it gave him a buff to his warlock abilities and i like to give warlocks an extra spell slot so that's oh absolutely they need it uh so that so it was uh he needs extra spell slot as long as he has it um but you can expend the charge that can't be regained to gain an answer to any question that you ask. Okay. And so he gets this stone. Does it need to be correct? What do you mean? Uh, d- does the does the answer to the question need to be truthful? Yes. Oh, okay. Because it's a he's a I, I like to think that the uh, the patron likes you as long as you provide him weird knowledge, <laughs> and so like. You, they, he was in a weird place doing weird stuff in this ancient abandoned dwarven city. So, I thought I thought he was probably in gun, good terms with the Braxis. Um, yeah. But he gets the stone, and he ends up in this huge uh, chasm, mm-hmm. like very cylindrical chasm. You can't even see the bottom. Yeah. With a pathway that walks around the side, and the first thing he does, he's had this thing for five minutes. He says, Warlock spell slot? Nah. He flips the coin down the pit and says, what's down there? And I I, I don't know what ex- answer he was expecting, but I gave him this whole uh, description about how you flip the coin down the pit and you watch it tumble into darkness, but it never, never falls out of view before you realize that you're tumbling down the pit after the coin in this out-of-body experience and you fall down into this massive underground chasm, this underground cave uh, cave space with a lake and so i gave him a basically a tour of like the next area and foresight for the campaign that is so cool i i love it when um you not just you but i i love it in settings like i'm really kind of understanding how to get back to that i'll get back to that I'm really understanding how expansive this topic actually is of how because you can look at any individual component and be like is this component successful is this component successful so illusion magic I think illusion magic is the most successful when you don't when you trick your players or trick quote unquote into not really knowing that they are in an illusion um that I think that that is a great time when uh, it's successful. Um, I think the only time I could have failed with that is if I had given him a, like a non-answer. Like the last thing yeah. I wanted to do with an item like that was be like, oh, it's just another cave. Yeah. Or, you you know, it's just there's the bottom of the chasm. Yeah. But I that's it's one of those things where I had already like thought about, you know, how this whole mm-hmm. space was interconnected and. I was like, ooh, that's actually a really good I guess question. That, I guess that's another thing to think, another like kind of thing to think about. It's 
it's it's going to be successful for as long as you're able to provide something like a no is a dead wall is just a dead end and in a lot of ways yes is also kind of a dead end so kind of playing that middle ground of like not entirely no and not entirely yes can be satisfying but um illusion magic one time that i feel that i used illusion magic successfully was you guys had um you were trying to basically there was a cave in in these dwarven mines and you were trying to go rescue somebody and in your efforts of navigating the of navigating the mines you fell through this um fell through this the floor into like this laboratory area and it was basically just a pit in the ground there was nothing around it that was um that would indicate how to get out of here and um i knew that i wanted to have a illusory wall but i didn't want it to just be like oh i'm gonna roll i'm gonna roll just keep rolling to see I wanted you guys to feel that you had accidentally stumbled into the wall. So somebody went to a wall and was trying to affix a python, like basically knock a python into the wall. I remember this now. And um, I was like, okay, make a strength check to um, set the python into the wall. And like, no matter how much they rolled, they just kept failing. It's like, yeah, you, you just can't seem to uh get it in uh get the python into the wall and like you guys are getting frustrated and you guys didn't even think you guys didn't even stop to think that it was an illusory wall until um oh, what was it i can't remember how you guys figured it out but essentially somebody walked through it or fell through it trying to like uh, basically climb the wall mm -hmm. you maybe it was something like you had successfully gotten one in on like the side of the frame or something and you tried to go in but you actually just fell through a wall and um there's actually something i've needed to ask about that session so yeah so about that illusion um it wasn't immediately obvious uh when we like sinking the python in it wasn't obvious that it just passed through so like the illusion was kind of like feeding on our expectation of mm -hmm. how it should interact. So this was like a strong illusion. Yeah. Okay. That was pretty cool. Yeah. I like illusions like that. I like I like that little extra step that's like that, you know, an illusion uh an illusion that can just like wave like a sign, mm -hmm. you know, is a little boring. I like I like the I'm like like you. I like the spicy illusions. Yeah, I um I think that's a precedent that you have to set for a campaign. But yeah. That's a whole other topic. I think so that there's a um, character in Hunter Hunter. What's his name? The the clown man. What's his name? Um, Hisoka. He has an awesome um, ability, and I think I try to kind of look at his version of illusion magic because it isn't really illusion magic. What he can do is he has a couple of abilities. He can change the appearance and texture of any object. And he also has a um, another ability where he can make this thing called bungee gum, where he can basically put gum on any two surfaces like and basically make it as elastic or brittle as he wants. So one thing he'll do is... Um, if he wants to, you know, change his appearance or something like this one point in time where he has like a back tattoo of a spider. And so what he does is he gets like a washcloth. He changes the texture and appearance to be that of his skin with a back tattoo. And then he just adheres it to his back and then he like rips it off at some other point. And it's like the weirdest fucking thing. Um, I think like that's a great I think he I think that was a really good example in media where illusion magic can be so subtle and so radically done well or poorly um i really hate the idea of 
somebody comes up to a barrel, looks at it, and it's just like, oh, that doesn't look right. You know what I mean? I, but just through mechanically rolling, I think if, um, you know, somebody comes up to a barrel and is like, huh, that barrel looks strange. And it's because the spellcaster hasn't uh, included shadows to properly do it, or it's a static image and the shadows are incorrectly yeah, keeping, placed. Yeah, keeping the skill of the caster in mind when you're yeah, thinking that, about the illusion. And that, and that might be a really satisfying thing. Like if uh, somebody rolls well, and uh, like let's say they roll like a 15 somebody and so, so they manage to trick some people because the barrel that they're trying to hide behind that they've summoned an illusion of it's only good for this one point at a time if somebody comes up with like a lantern looks at it and it's like that's weird the shadow's not going in the terms of the lantern but maybe if they rolled like higher than a 15 they would have had like an accurate representation of the shadows and I think saying that kind of thing, like adding those little extra tidbits, those nuggets, those giblets of uh, details really kind of sells it. Um, especially like with illusion magic. I think um, there was this uh, book called the uh, graphic novel called Autumn Lands. And I had never seen a book where they were like, a piece of media where they're using magic and then describing how the magic feels as they're channeling it through their bodies. And it's like, that's so cool. Um, mm -hmm. And it's like, it's more, it's, it was more than just like, imagine a river expanding to harness more of your power kind of stuff. It was, uh, yeah, my eyes are burning and I'm getting a headache because my body is not accustomed to handling this much magical energy flowing through my body. And like one guy gets his eyes burned out because it's <laughs> because it's too much energy for him to handle all at once. Yeah, I, I think that that's the kind of thing, too, that you can put in as a gimme. Like if you if you have an illusion, if you have like, say, that barrel illusion, like you just said, mm -hmm. if you if you. Just put a barrel illusion or some kind of illusion in uh, even though you know that one of your players has been like min maxing their perception mm -hmm. putting in that gimme is just it's just like a little way to to set up a cool yeah. a cool situation for the player like you can even compartmentalize it where you know you have a house with three rooms and so that player has to go into the right room to realize that you know half the floor is an illusion right but once they do, they feel like they feel gratified for having built their character that way, even though it was just passive perception. You see it. Yeah. One one really cool illusion that I heard of was, um, it was a demonstration where you make somebody think that there is a bridge, and the bridge is only halfway completed, and so they walk over the bridge. And as they get over, in their mind's eye, they think that they're continuing to walk across the bridge, but they're actually falling to their death. <laughs> and I think that that, like, the... I, th I think the way that you sell illusions is by having that slip into the illusion itself. That's where it... That's how you sell it. And having that being, like, convincing and... Um, convincing and what's the, what's the word i'm looking for like uh unex unexpected or what would that word be unanticipated yeah kind of there's probably some better word but i'm not gonna sit here and mm -hmm. be, a, be a dork there was that reminds me just just like a bridge encounter reminds me of a time um where of like you know something that I just let be a fun moment for, mm -hmm. for the whole group. Um, there was an encounter that I totally stole from somewhere. I couldn't tell you where I stole it from, mm -hmm. but um, basically there was a, uh, it was just, it was just supposed to be a loot room. So there's a big, there's a loot pile on, on a pillar in the middle of the room with a chest on top, bottomless chasm below it, and a, uh, a rope bridge between where the players enter this chasm room and the chest. But instead of the rope bridge hanging down, it's hang it's hanging up in an arc, and like my players 
looked at it, and they said, nope. And they turned around and left. And, I, and for a second, I was bummed because I was like, oh, that was a cool encounter that I ripped off. But then, like, it was just something that we all got to laugh about because it was just like, and I, and, but the, the key to that situation is never tell them the answer in case they ever go back. Cause you yeah. know, you only get the answer if you engage with it, but it was just, that was just a funny moment. Yeah. Yeah. And in a lot of ways uh, that is, despite them not interacting with it, that is successful because you successfully just inspired fear. <laughs> like yeah. they, that, that those players lost an intimidation check to a rope bridge. Exactly. So, um, yeah, yeah the kind of situation where we, you know, it wasn't like an in-game moment that I, I planned out to be cool for anybody, but it was just kind of like a, a like group of friends fun moment, you know, cause at the end of the day, we're still playing a game. Mm -hmm. True. You know, what else makes uh, what else makes a good session? We've got, um, the first point. <laughs> Yeah, the, the first point that I have just started taking notes on, we're, we're very professional. Exactly. Coming in. Yeah. We, we're, we're different here. Most people like to come in with their bullets. We write our bullets as we go through. <laughs> well, no, we forget to write our bullets and then try to, oh, what do we say? Um, but yeah, I know. I think that what you just said gets us back on track. You said um, what makes a good session originally we started talking by what what makes something successful and i think what makes a good session kind of broadens that focus in a nice way i, I would honestly say just the player energy mm -hmm. um the the energy that everyone's bringing to the table there can be there can be sessions where somebody just isn't feeling it or is just kind of like maybe they had a bad week and they are just really kind of negative there's and there's definitely points in time where it's just super um it, pe people just don't come don't come to the table just with their best yeah just this weekend we were supposed to have another session of our campaign mm -hmm. and um i overpacked our my weekend mm -hmm. and i just you know i didn't i didn't uh follow through with the session because i knew that i i wouldn't run a good session this weekend because i i just like i've been on the move too much mm. but you know i'm still excited for our next session yeah but like j just this weekend i was like oh this isn't gonna happen this is this wouldn't be good wouldn't be fun yeah let's put it off yeah that totally is something to think about um in the session like maybe you have like what will translate to four or maybe six hours of gameplay but you know maybe by hour one and a half people are just really just kind of slogging through and it's like you aren't really feeling the energy maybe you had a long week and you aren't really feeling the energy to like continue the session it's like yeah you know just change gears like you know let's like put a pause here we'll figure out what's up and you know we'll play a board game maybe we'll get some food and like just have a fun night because um at the end of the day like the people around your table are your friends and who you want to be around right mm -hmm. and it's like you know forming that camaraderie and friendship uh outside the game is just as important maybe that's another topic how to make friends <laughs> i need that topic i need that topic too <laughs> um but yeah so let's try. So let's try to uh, let's try to put put together some more lists because I got some going. So it's highlighting players, highlighting players. Um, challenge, challenge. We said that was the the aforementioned first bullet. Mm -hmm. Player energy. I maybe maybe table energy is better than player energy. Yeah, it really just takes, especially the dungeon master, but it just takes one person to just be you know not have the energy right. But mm, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes, sometimes, like, yeah. I I definitely know that I have played in a few games where there have been, like, the quote-unquote problem player. There have been times when I've been the oh, problem, yeah. when I've been the problem player, and because I've just been, like, murder hoboing, and I should just, like... We all have that phase. Yeah. It's a dark phase. It's a dark phase. It's a very dark phase. There's mood... But then there's also being in the uh, like being in the mindset of like, oh, okay, I have these goals that I want. This is what I want to what I want to accomplish this session, either as a DM or as a player. 
because like there's definitely what the players want to accomplish right maybe maybe the players want to clear out a dungeon maybe the players want to um finally talk to an npc uh, or finish up some kind of story point and i feel like as a dm dm should be receptive to to that really and be yeah, res- i think it's a big thing to you know expect that your plan goes out the window in the first 15 minutes of your session true that's um in the beginning i was touching on this a little bit but um it's the the idea that your players can just go off the map and that's why i said like i i keep a i keep a, a combat encounter in the holster because they take a lot of time and it, it gives me that buffer before i have to like dive into a zone i'm not prepared for so you know i think uh in game rewarding rewarding uh where your players find their interest Mm -hmm. and not you know being like no 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 the train tracks are over there right Mm -hmm. uh is a is a great way to have a good session and even if it's not what you planned at all there's great ways to generate the illusion that this was your plan the whole time because that's that's the heart of being a dungeon master at the end of the day, right? Mm-hmm. So being flexible and being prepared. And being prepared to be flexible. I think there's... Uh, D&D at its heart is just improv. And the core tenet of improv is always saying yes and to whatever the other person says. Yeah, going, yeah absolutely. And I think that's the word I was trying to get at by saying... Um, no is a wall and yes is kind of also a wall so having can be a wall yeah it can be and definitely definitely i feel one way to kind of put yourself into a hole is and really have um unsatisfying an unsatisfying experience is to constantly say yes yeah i think that's how murder hobos are uh you know born and incentivized right but you buy you know giving them the uh the air to you know keep murder hoboing i think i think a, an interesting skill eventually generated uh to in response to murder hobos is being like ha ha that's so funny so what are you guys really doing you know like not saying that directly that, but they're like that's a funny joke what you just said yeah the figuring out a way to be passive to passively aggressively yeah, and, redirect the energy exactly yeah. No, 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 no yeah not jokes and jokes but yeah, no. Um, what's his What's his face? What's the uh, What's the redhead from um, Brandon Lee Mulligan? Is that his name? Brandon Lee Mulligan. Brandon Lee Mulligan. I was watching a YouTube short of him, and he had a great. Um, he had a great clip that was about translating energy, right? And he was like, well, a player might say, oh, I want to take a bomb out of my butt and throw this. I want, I want to like fart really hard and um, create this fog cloud to make everyone really stinky. And it's like, okay, so what you want to do is create some sort of AOE effect that distracts everybody in this area. Mm-hmm. You And... Understanding what the players are asking, understanding like what should be done as a result, I think that that is um, that was that was the core of what he was saying. Um, so, so yeah, understanding just understanding how to translate the energy. Um, so if I came to you, right, and and um, you have something you let's say you have like this boat encounter planned Mm -hmm. and um we're on the boat and i'm just kind of like uh whatever we're just gonna do whatever i'm not really feeling the boat i'm not really feeling the boat travel maybe i want combat maybe i want a more narrative um experience how would you go about kind of engaging me when I'm not, when I kind of see this as just a, I, I just want to get to the next, I see this as like a loading screen episode. You know, this is like something that's filler. How would you, how do you think you would go about like engaging that kind of player? Do you want someone who doesn't want to get in the boat? Um, Either, either doesn't want to get in the boat. I know I'm like, I'm, we're cooking up a, cooking up a scenario here and we got so many variables let's say let's say i'm willing to get onto the boat um 
but I am you can tell that the the enthusiasm for kind of existing on this boat is just kind of boring you know like as the player is like bored by it what do you think would be a good way to what, what would be your process of going about engaging that player well if the player is uh is this like a combat combat enthusiast player yeah let's you go can have let's all, go down that route you can have all kinds of uh if this is a pirate ship all kinds of like mm-hmm. of sea encounters um you know if you don't want to run combat i know there i've i've seen some um scenarios like this where they are they're traveling but they're just being chased by a dragon turtle the whole time mm-hmm. so it, so their their travel isn't isn't innately day-to-day dangerous but if they slow down for a second the dragon turtle is going to get them mm-hmm. so so over mul- multiple days of travel it's it's just like how do i keep the boat going fast what can i do to like keep going or if the pl- and if the players want to they can turn around and fight the dragon turtle that's what they're uh they're they're like you know their modus operandi is mm-hmm. i would also say that uh a boat is a fantastic time to have a murder mystery. <laughs> it's a fantastic t- because it's it's so classic. It's it's uh, murder on the Oriental Express. It's glass onion. It's uh, you know what whatever that word is for a episode that happens in one location. I've always wanted to run uh, a Hateful Eight campaign. I've never watched Hateful Eight. It's a movie about uh, about eight cowboys who uh, hunker down in this tavern mm-hmm. um, for uh, this blizzard. So they're all trapped in the tavern for a blizzard. And over the course of the movie, you find out that every single character in the bar has a vendetta against somebody else. And the f- and then they find like the owner's dead in the basement. And there's this, it's this whole crazy, hilarious, um, like, I don't even call it a murder mystery, but like this whole, like... That's very two, interesting. Two hours of like uh, a standoff, really. Uh-huh. Just just you two hours of them. anxiety. Exactly. That's awesome. That's an that's very interesting. Um, that's interesting to me because they don't really care at that point. They don't really care about uh, who who did this murder. The only thing they care about is not dying and getting the revenge that they want. Yeah, uh, and we should watch that at some point. That's oh, not, I'd be so down. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, so, how would uh, so that's that kind of that kind of sparks my brain, it tickle tickles my funny bone. Um, how would you how would you go about what? Not how would you go about, but what? How do you know when you have successfully? Um, adapted media or the, your like what you have tried to do has been successful like what you're trying to accomplish has been successful oh I think you just look for the hallmarkers that we've been kind of using for this uh, whole conversation right like um, did, did the players get to have cool moments mm-hmm. um, did the did the mechanisms come out to be fun um I, I, I often do like brain exercises mm-hmm. uh, thinking like if I'm having fun in a video game, I'm like, this is such, such a fun part of this video game. Could you even possibly adapt this to D&D? I think the one that my brain has never really wrapped itself around is uh, Shadow of the Colossus, like fighting a gigantic enemy that you have to like scale up and attack certain parts of. Um so really it's uh i think it's about you know just being aware of what you're trying to adapt and i think you have to look for the hallmarks before launching it of if it can be adapted but really it's you know just that the players had fun they got their cool moments if it was if it was a challenge that is something that is something to think about um one can you adapt it like is there is there something in the media of what you're trying to do um that just doesn't translate to a less visually uh to a to a less visual media like D D, where you're kind of limited by pencil and paper or um terrain 
in whatever way that you can generate it, right? So like if I'm trying to recreate the Kratos versus Kronos fight, um, I'm gonna have to figure out some way to translate that. Maybe maybe it kind of means like I have multiple sheets of paper that represent like different things, but because at the end of the day, like am I really gonna go and make like an eight foot tall behemoth and have like characters yeah, pick up to. their mini and like climb this man you would have to that's one of the things that i i thought about with that shadow of the classes example is that you would have to have a prop like map of the thing mm -hmm. and because it's a moving thing ideally you also want to you know be able to move it which is such that'd be such a time investment such to an build that. yeah it would be such a such a labor and then also understanding your skill as a dm too mm -hmm. i feel like understanding where your strengths as a dm lie and what your players like because you might you might do everything correctly do everything right but if your play group just isn't um a good if if this piece of whatever that you're trying to use just isn't right for your play group it's just not going to feel satisfying and successful like um and it's totally fine to like acknowledge like you know you you aren't matt mercer when it right. comes to like being able to give such a beautifully articulated description of something you aren't you aren't like a, a writer that's trying that's like putting together like these beautiful pose you aren't like yeah. x y or z you're just you're just you so understanding like your limitations as a dm um it's, it's also good because like you know you can see where you can grow and it's like i feel like for every single person who's a dm and every single player is a writer you mm -hmm. know and like if you're a player you're writing characters and you're like understanding the characterization if you're a dm you're you're writing care sure you're writing a lot more in terms of like uh locations culture places whatever have you and i think these skills will come with time yeah absolutely and if you're if but if you're being a good dm mm -hmm. you'll develop the skills that um engage your players so if our like i said our group is kind of more combat centric i feel i i will probably get better at developing cool interesting combat encounters but i might never never get the flowery language of matt mercer like you just said yeah and um i'm with me, I'm a very visually inclined DM. I love using props and minis. And so instead of actually being like, there's parchment over here, an apple over here, the spilled wine on the carpet, blah, 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 does all this stuff, looks so pretty. I'll just build a set that has everything that I want. And I won't take I won't have notes on a, on a room. I'll just build the room exactly how I visualize it. Mm -hmm. and um you know with like whatever 3d printed props or whatever painting stuff i do and people will be like well what's in the room and i'll be like well what you see and then i'll go into greater detail as they point and what like what's this oh that's a bookshelf it has all this and whatever um that's a great way to engage your players too mm -hmm. because they can they can you know engage with every part of it and and just start like digging their fingers into the into the map you made and they're like oh what's this what's this what's this what's this mm -hmm. there's nothing there's nothing like you know nothing left out of a description that just you know lies fallow because no one engaged with it because it's you know it's right there on the page yeah totally um i think another way to understand whether or not you've had a good successful session is asking for criticism as yeah. to what you're doing that's um that's a big a big thing that I do and I you like to do that too um after the end of the session we'll just like stop and be like hey everybody let's come around and like really talk this over for a sec like what what did you like what did you not like uh how can I improve um what do you th and literally just asking your players hey what do you think was successfully done here like what do you think was um what, what do you think I did well? What do you think I can improve on? And I think that those have been the most educational things. And also, um, sometimes giving that question time. Like, 
maybe maybe you want maybe people need to ruminate on it like maybe they're coming out like they're really like they just had like a really emotional moment and maybe they are really happy about like the way it ended so they aren't really thinking about the the build up and maybe the build up was a little lackluster or maybe it's reverse where the mo the majority of the session was good but the very ending was like kind of lackluster so giving people time to really ruminate on the entirety of the session and understand what they did and didn't like about it i think is a really uh really important yeah that's something i didn't realize that i even did until you you uh talked to me about it at one point um but sometimes um it's sometimes that's the fun of it right like last week uh in our campaign we got to this section uh where it was we were running a module where um they got into this dungeon that was like very windy and like predominantly empty. Mm -hmm. And so I looked this over and I was like, is this going to be a fun dungeon for my players? And I, you know, I have another dungeon master in my party. So I was like, you know what? I can add, I'll, I'll add this a little bit here. I'll add this a little bit here. But overall, I'm kind of excited to have this conversation at the end of the session. Like, what did you guys think of this dungeon? I thought it was like, it's cool. And it, it begs so many questions about, uh, about you know the dungeon design, and I think mm -hmm. we had a cool conversation afterwards too. Yeah. I enjoyed the conversation as much as the session. And uh, what I think was also really interesting was um, so that was a session with three people, um, me, um, and our two and our two other friends. And what was interesting about that was all of us were very different players and very different in approaching the style. Uh, uh, had very different styles of approaching that dungeon. Matt was, you know, just being a classic gamer and overturning every single stone, every single nook and cranny had to be explored. Um, he, he, we went into like this dwarven ruin, which is kind of like a dwarven, small dwarven fortress in the, just kind of nestled in a cave. And there was like an, an anvil that, you know, you need to roll on, make a skill check, and then a 1d6 chance to see the result of just haphazardly smashing steel against steel. Mm -hmm. And he made a dagger that blinded him. He, and then he made another dagger that crits on a, uh, 19 a 19 or 20. or 20. And it's like, cool. That's that's awesome that you did that, buddy. Um <laughs> And so, and for him, that was satisfying because he was, he did that. He found like these, uh, this room full of skulls. He found these different pits and locations and whatever. But then, um, Ksenia, she was just kind of, she was kind of bored by it a little bit of like, there's, there's nothing immediately beneficial. So who cares if we're here? Like, you know, maybe we can come back. But like, there's nothing here at the moment, so we're just kind of wasting our time, just like fumbling around with this nonsense. So who? So so she was like, so she was kind of. I mean, she was kind of um, checked out a little bit. Kind of kind of didn't really care too much about the the nitty gritty of going through, which you know, totally fair. I got the sense that you're kind of in between those two points. It depends I, on the room. I was. I was. I was kind of in between because I was like, once we, once we found like the main burial chamber and then a couple of those, like three or four of those off rooms, I was like, okay, there's nothing here. It's just kind of like a burial chamber now. And there's just a bunch of traps everywhere. We should just leave. Like who cares? And in a lot of ways, like this place isn't even it isn't even necessary to achieving our main goal. Like our main goal is get out of these, like mad, this magical forest that is beguiling and twisting. It's like exploring ruins doesn't. And that's like what my character cares about. It's like exploring ruins doesn't matter to me, you know? So you think that it might've had a better session if um, I had somehow interjected a conversation amongst the characters of like, the, their purpose in the dungeon well so i think i think that could have been i think that could have been i think that could have been good so 
Ksenia, what she loves is character interaction between player uh, players. She she is a huge role play player. She really really likes the role play. She likes being able to live through her character in the setting. Um, Matt is a very mechanical, or m at least much more mechanical than like I am. I feel because he he felt inclined to overturn every stone. I don't really care, you know. I I can turn over every stone, or I can't. I I feel like I get the most satisfaction when I embody my character as I feel the character should be, and the character that I was playing is just this like anxious little twerp who like almost got crushed by a literal meat grinder and is like I'm done <laughs> I'm, go I'm good to go home like I, I don't want to be here anymore and yeah. that and that was like how I was embodying it so I I feel like I and there wasn't any combat in that so so I think I think it was cool I think it was a cool session and it definitely plays into like the more the slower more meandering nature of this uh encounter uh, of this um module module so far and it kind of sets the precedent of like not every single problem is going to be uh fraught with with combat you know mm -hmm. it kind of it kind of shows that this is not necessarily a thinking man's module, but it's it's a much more slower pace module. That's my that was my takeaway from it, and um, you know understanding that that will be the expectation that I'll go into it. Like I already had another one where my expectations were subverted, where we came across a giant that was like sleeping under a uh, under a tree, and he was friendly, and he was just like this big sleepy boy, and I was like. I love my big sleepy my, boy. My character was like, I don't want to get eaten. I, <laughs> I, I do not want to talk to this guy. And then Ksenia was like, I'm going to go fuck with him. Because, you know, that's, her character is kind of like a little bit sadistic. and a like, rascal. Yeah, a rascal. She likes she likes uh, poking the bear. And um, I definitely, like, I, I lean towards indulging that and Matt's, um, you know, no stone unturned. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm the exact same way. Mm -hmm. I think I don't come across that way a lot because I like to play really dumb characters. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, I want to do that. Oh, but my, I don't think my character is smart enough to put those two things mm -hmm. together. But like, I because I have that instinct, I like to indulge players when they when they start overturning stones. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's fun. I and I mean, like, I'm for me, like, I'm all about what the energy of the party is. So I'm always down to. Um, go with what the energy of the party was so i was like and the energy of the party was in between and that's where i was but i i think overall i think it was successful i think it definitely could have been more successful if there was more kind of stuff that was uncovered as we went through the session uh as we went through the dungeon mm -hmm. but um all in all i had fun yeah, I mean, like, keep in mind that, like, part of my, my plan was that, like, oh, I have some, de like, people who, like, talk about game design in the party, so this mm -hmm. is going to be a, it wasn't even entirely about the session, it was also about the conversation afterwards. Yeah. I was excited to have that conversation, yeah. too. Yeah, and in a lot of ways, um, you know, bad, not that this was a bad session, but quote-unquote bad sessions can really inform, um, inform you uh, on how to dm i have learned much more on um from the from the sessions where everybody just is, kind of walks away with a sour taste in their mouth from the table mm -hmm. than i have like the positive ones because it's like you know um and i feel like i've had more positive uh sessions than i have had negative sessions um but there definitely have been uh, negative sessions too and kind of like encountering those and like not being discouraged by them um, I think is really important right for example what what's it called uh, Horde of the Dragon Queen what, whatever whatever the first whatever the first Rise of Tiamat was whatever the right. first module was I so I've run that encounter at Green Greenest a couple of times 
and no one has like stuck with the campaign to like go further than that but i've literally ran that done the same thing that's so funny yeah i've literally ran that like the the village being raided i've ran that like two or three times the first time i ran it was just an absolute nightmare it was so really yeah it was so awful um I didn't understand the pace that the encounter was supposed to feel. So I was looking at the map that they had, and the map that they had is just gigantic. And um, going from place to place, if you take every sing- if you take the time to count up every single thing, it takes so long to get to the top. And it's like, honestly, your player should get to the should. I feel that that entire thing should be like getting to the keep fending off the keep and then like going out and doing missions or whatever could be like one encounter maybe two encounters Mm -hmm. so um i also noticed that there's no way a party of level ones could do that whole thing so i i leveled up the party it the, the campaign is set up to be milestone i did it by experience as soon as they got the experience like you're level two yeah so i I also give them that that as a heal so yeah so that that was another thing um the the book challenge rating and what they expect players to do is totally totally um out of sync yeah out of sync like like a wolf that's like a cr1 half or something can shred a party of four especially if you throw two of them at them um an orc which you would think a level one fighter could fight like a CR one fourth orc or CR one half orc or whatever the hell it is. It's like the only way that the player can defeat an orc, like a level one fighter can defeat an orc is if they go first and roll high. There's also an encounter in that, that you are, the player is supposed to lose. One player is supposed to lose against the the challenge, right? So Getting that's that, yeah. basically knocking a player out for the rest of the the village encounters. Yeah. So the um, so the way that the encounter feels, the way that it feels is that it feels that it should um, the players basically go on this this crusade through the town, rescuing everybody that they can getting up to the keep depositing those people um i mean maybe maybe not it's been years since i've read that thing Mm -hmm. i but i re i do remember there being people in the streets and like my the instinct being you should go help those people and then it gives like a random encounter uh i think it gives like a random encounter table basically going up to the keep and it's like every couple hundred feet there should be an encounter or something like that i think that's how it i threw that out I, so yeah, so I was like looking at that and I was like, that's insane. So what I, so what the first time I ran it, I did it as ridden and it was just slog. Basically everybody was almost dead by the time that they got there. And then the blue dragonborn came up and challenged somebody. And it's like, how is this supposed to be fun? This literally just feels like I'm just beating my players. And the blue dragon strafes. Yeah. So what I did, yeah, 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 yeah. So what I did was... Um, on the second time I ran that, so getting up to the keep, everything I did was just small, hectic encounters. There was no big initial confrontation. It was just like pandemonium, and it felt like they were able to wind one path through it and eventually got up to it by by basically feeling like light resistance and it just being like, yeah, the path that you took was the path that you were able to get to the keep. And by doing so, it, it, it kind of gave the, the impression of there's just a whole bunch of combat going around. And this is just like you, you lucked out in being able to circumvent stuff. And so every, so what I did was, because they don't, I think they do say for every villager that you get, you get some amount of experience. Mm-hmm. So I was awarding experience for villagers and for avoiding combat encounter. Uh, basic, basically, I was just giving experience for everything that they were doing. And um, the, the rules as written really only dictate, in 5th edition, really only dictate give experience when something dies, right? 
which not really that good because it doesn't incentivize a role role play, role play like or whatever. That. So yeah, so I was doing that, and then um, the next part of the encounters were you have all these different missions that you can do. Like you need to go through the sewers. There's like a grain mill. There's like a church or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like there's a couple other things. And then there's like the Sally port. And I can't remember how I did it. I think what I think what I did was I broke. I, I, the first time I did it, I tried to do all of them at once. Basically like, just do all this stuff or whatever. And the second time, and because everybody, uh, everybody was like, so like beaten, they couldn't do anything. And it's like, what, what the hell is going on here? So the second time I ran it, I just showered them in healing potions. Um, I think there, I think there might be something where if you find like the governor or something, he gives you like a couple of health potions, but I just was like, uh, yeah, crack open the PHP. You can have anything that's listed. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, you want, you want your two guys to have full plate shields, whatever. F totally fine. You're, you're in the govern the local mayor's armory. Of course they're going to have this. You want like 20 health potions for every single person. You want like a spell scroll, a fireball at like level two. Go ahead. Pop off, King. Yeah. Like, um, and like, I think that that was like a great, that was like first time slog. Uh, and then understanding it, like being able to look at what I did critically and then go back and um, redo it much more successfully. And I think that, I honestly think that um, the greenest encounter is a great piece as like like encapsulated in a thing, but I feel like it needs to, it needed a lot of work. Like, I think that it should have been getting up to the thing, uh, as you get up to the thing, the dragon totally should have gone away. It's no long, it, it basically was just here to shock everything. And, um, sorry, I just want to make sure that we're still recording. Are you hearing the buzzing? I am hearing the buzzing. That could be a problem. Ah, uh, who cares? We aren't professional. True. Oh yeah. Have the dragon just fly away immediately as you get to the keep. He was, the dragon was just there to just bombard it and then fuck off. And then, um, have the guy challenge you. But it's like, I feel like that is a great time to have a NPC, like maybe uh, have an NPC who rolls up to the... Uh, I think there's a built-in one. Like if no player accepts the challenge, this NPC accepts it and gets diesel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was one time. That was one time. One time I ran it. The third time I ran it, I had the players um, get to the village. Be, uh, they basically intercepted um, a letter saying that there were troops rallying to greenest to basically raid it so what they did was they got there early and basically mounted a, a defense and the whole game was basically falling back to the <laughs> to the keep to hold out and then the blue dragonborn would challenge them and the npc that was like this just big badass just got taken out and that kind of gives that narrative oh so you built up this npc as a badass for the whole siege Oh, that's cool. And then I he like gets that. and then he gets killed by this champion. And now it's like now it's a hook of like the players want revenge on this dragonborn for who, killing the bro. For killing their bro. And it also set it's like, yo, bro was this much above us. And and he just like made him look like dirt. So it's like even more of a of craziness. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of lucked out. I, I heard rumors about Horde of the Dragon Queen, mm -hmm. which is taking a beating towards the end of this video. Yeah. And uh, I took, like I said, I took out the random encounters. I think I left one in because you want to have that sense of like there's chaos uh -huh. and like, people running around. But yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to overrun them. The second thing, like I said, I gave them, I gave them the level up as soon as they had earned it experience wise. Mm -hmm. And with that <clears> level up, I, I said, when you level up, you regain all your health points. You regain all your spell slots. You yeah. regain all of your resources. Yeah. Um, because you're going to need it. And then um, there was a, and this, you know, to loop it all back, 
um, for, with cool moments. Um, Matt was playing a cavalry, a cavalier, uh, halfling fighter, mm-hmm. and he tried to animal handling check a uh, guard drake, which was another thing. Level one party cannot handle a guard. Drake. Oh my god! No, absolutely not. So I was I was already thinking like this is the best way to resolve this. We'll let well I'll like be very I'll, I'll keep the the DC low. I'll I'll like try to make this work for him as much as possible because then they'll have a guard drake yeah. on their side. Of course he rolls like natural twenties mm-hmm. for all of his mm-hmm. animal handling checks. It's like oh they got a guard drake now, and so it all Hell went, yeah. it all went very smoothly after yeah. that. He, his name the character's name was Sir Diddly Demas. <laughs> <laughs> and he he did accept and and lost the dragonborn fight but but that also creates a a um a vendetta kind of motivation uh which is another another cool thing like like if that's a that's a cool moment uh that that kind of gets drawn out because you are now driven by that revenge and a, a player in that balrog encounter he wants to kill that balrog so bad now because that balrog made him made him run away yeah in the in the encounter with the gnolls like everybody wants to save that crab that oh, they yeah. realized was being mind control i want to cook that crab yeah you want to eat him i want to eat him so i love crab yeah yeah so good we we need to have a crab buffet someday oh yeah Crab. We'll Every have time we get sushi crab. at a crab buffet. That's true. I'm ta- I'm talking like old bay, boil old them bay. in butter, do some stuff. So I think um I think that this is a pretty good list. Uh, I've, we've been taking notes. Um, highlight players, highlight individual players through challenge. Understand the table energy. Be flexible come prepared to the session whether that's your your notes as a as a dm or um understanding what you want to do as a player um as a dm figure out how to translate energy where uh where necessary um understand your play group understand what types of players they are understand what they want what they want to accomplish and after the session um leave it open for criticism and understand how you can improve right i was just thinking about um we kind of built on table energy so the the that last one i think in my mind links back to table energy keep them keep your eye on table energy or be aware of table energy before during and after a session yep yep but i think that's a good list i think we i think we killed it I think i think this was a uh, successful episode don't you agree i definitely agree all right well We'll ruminate on that and get back to it and then cringe later. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Yeah, well, thank you for, thanks for uh, us. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks for watching this uh, episode. Thanks for taking the time to uh, listen to two dudes ramble about uh, their improv games. Absolutely. Have a good night. Good night, y'all.